So I want to wish everybody a happy noon Eastern time or close to noon. And my name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm generally the host of EdChat Interactive. Uh, today we have uh, pretty much the most popular session that we've had in at least three years when machines read minds how your teaching is going to change so most of you have found us in order to, to register but um, if you if you want to see what other events we have that's on www.edchatinteractive.org and then I was looking at, at some of the comments or questions that you all have have posted to John and having looked at the presentation I think we're going to be covering them, but people were interested in what are the practical applications of being able to read minds, how machines measure what they and and what do the machines measure about about minds, um, how is this going to impact remote learning since uh, since we're all in a very different situation now than than we were six months ago. Um, does this point to different types of activities being more engaging or better for learning? And a lot of questions were really related to like game-based learning or project-based yeah. learning and, and what does that show? So I know, John, that um, it, it's, it's, it was so interesting because these questions came up and they're pretty much exactly what your presentation is, is going to go through. So I just want to, you know, in, in, just say John is one of the, the most intelligent persons that I've ever met, um, and and incredibly competent, and um, yeah, yeah, you can shake your 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 hand at that, but but I've we've we've talked three or four times, so uh, this is going to be a fascinating session. If you have questions, probably the easiest way to to ask the questions is going to be through the chat. So. Um, so feel free to uh, to chat, and I'm going to be monitoring the questions and um, and transmitting them to John. So um, I'm I'm recording this. Um, there's a question about are we allowed to record? I don't know what Zoom allows, but um, if uh, I I don't myself have an objection to people recording, uh, but I'm recording and I'll and I'll post the archive on on our website and on and on YouTube and I'll email everybody. So with that. Uh, John, um, go ahead. Well, then I'll say uh, good morning to uh, to you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your uh, midday, morning, afternoon, or whatever time it is. I think we have people actually from all around the world, so it could be literally any time. Thank you so much for joining us. Some very simple logistics. First, I'm going to check with our Master of Ceremonies, Mitch, and ask if you can see me and if they can see me here waving. I, I see you waving. All right, fantastic. Um, uh, give me a wave back, that's wonderful. Yes, if you can, give me a wave back, folks. Wave to the camera. All right, I see hands, that's really good. Okay, lovely. I'm gonna assume you can all hear. Should you have any technical difficulties during this um, webinar, you're welcome to interrupt me. The problem is it won't help you because I don't understand the platform. So Mitch is gonna be sitting here in the background the whole time. And uh, if you send up a signal flare, I'm sure he'll see it and respond to it. We're going to be done today by 2 p.m. Uh, sorry, what am I saying? We're going to be done today one hour from now is what I should have said. So on the hour, an hour from now, whatever time zone you might be in. So that should enable you to plan your day um, around that. And that does include some time for questions at the end. Um, Zoom also has facilities for you, I know, to raise your hand or flag your uh, interest or a question somehow. If you are a Zoom expert, feel free to do it. Mitch will see it and, and manage that. If like me, you're not a Zoom expert and you're old fashioned, you're gonna do what I just did and make notes with a pen on paper and save until the end. Um, either way is fine. And uh, since you have all joined us, I've been making some notes that uh, today before the webinar, um, people said they were hoping to hear about practical applications, methods of measurement, the impact on remote learning, and are there any new or different activities for teaching and training and learning that come out of this? Um, I've, I've just made those notes a moment ago, and I promise you these things will be covered on the webinar and welcome again. I've now been talking long enough for Mitch to have seen any complaints about can't hear you, can't see you. So if I don't see him madly flagging me, I'm going to begin. Uh, first of all, the least important thing. Uh, my name's John Cole. Uh, this is going to be very brief. In real life, I work for a company called Team Results USA. That's actually what that shirt is that I'm wearing there. And what we do in real life is we run simulations. And this is not uh, any kind of uh, promotion for that. So don't be apprehensive. 
I'm just telling you what I do for a living normally. Uh, we normally run two day simulations uh, on the subject of teamwork and leadership. Uh, and these are different in that it, the whole principle is that um, is the practice is the best preparation. So there are no PowerPoints, no lectures, no nothing. Uh, it's all completely face-to-face -face practicing and rehearsing leadership behaviors. Can you do that online as well? Yes, you can, but that's not the subject for today. So I'm going to move on. The subject for today is when machines read minds, how your teaching and training programs are going to change. So let's begin with a picture. I promise not to make a mess of this. I'm going to share my screen. Mitch is going to tell me if I'm doing this correctly. Uh, and right don't now, forget to click the sound thing on your screen. I, much to your, much to Mitch's amazement, ladies and gentlemen, I have actually remembered to click the sound thing, which is probably the first time ever in our rehearsals that I've got it right the first time. So here you should be seeing a picture. If you do not, please let Mitch know. Uh, you're seeing two people. To the left, the lady with the blonde hair is Amanda Biller. She is actually the operations manager of Team Results USA. You can see that she's wearing an EEG headset. To the right is Trisha Galloway. Trish is senior EEG technician at the, uh, at the uh, Institute for Brain Research, which is part of the School of Medicine in, the, in UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles. So she's part of the UCLA School of Medicine at the Brain Research Institute where she works closely with the emeritus head of that institute, a guy named Professor Ron Stevens. Here you can see Trish uh, attaching a headset to a, an EEG headset to Amanda's head. And right off the bat, just to give you an idea of how far the technology has come lately and how quickly it's going to become relevant to you and me, not as academics, not as researchers, but as practitioners in the field, be we trainers, educators, providers of training, providers of learning platforms, whatever we are, what you're looking at there, that headset that Amanda's wearing, this is about five years ago, that's $20,000. Uh, my wife and I recently went to the CES, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, as I'm sure many of you did. You can now get excellent headsets for about $90. They're not as uh, good for science as the one that Amanda is wearing there, but the point I'm making is that these technologies, as they become popular, useful, and in demand, are nosediving in price as all technologies do. There's a famous law about that called Moore's Law, M-O-O-R-E, which you can look up on the internet if you want. Here is today's plan. Um, by the way, if you're not looking at a picture of uh, two women, one wearing an EEG headset and the other one putting an EEG headset on their head, then something's wrong, please let Mitch know. Uh, just a minute and we do this. Before we take another step and before we even reach the agenda, I want to show you one thing um, and quickly explain what this is. Not long ago, I was giving a talk to a room full of people, about 100, 120, I think. And these are the people that you and I need. Uh, this is a group called the Training Officers Consortium. So this is 120 people who have the money to spend. They are the ones that decide what the money gets spent on for training and development in the school system, certainly, but also generally in government and even to some degree in industry. Uh, they are the ones who decide whether or not they're going to invest in a new serious gaming platform, in a new method of K-12 education, whether the old methods are going to be eliminated or kept. These are the decision makers. And I wasn't going to pass up the opportunity <laughs> when presented with a crowd of 120 decision makers to ask them a question. You're looking at the answer here. This is like Jeopardy. The question was this, um, how up to date is an expert, as a designer, a chooser, a a C-level budget decider on training and development of all kinds. How up to date do you think the current training offerings are that you're looking at and using? Uh, is the stuff that you're being offered now right up to date? Or is it more 1990s era? Is it 1980s era? You know, those of you who were alive then remember Flared Pence and the Bay City Rollers. 1970s era, very young David Cassidy. Or the 1960s era, the Beatles. Uh, which of the eras does most training content come from? I fully expected most people to say maybe 1990s era, because in the history of philosophy and science, uh, history and philosophy of science, it generally takes between 10 to 20 years for new ideas to reach the front line of practitioners. Today, we're going to look at some new ideas. I think they'll be here in a lot sooner than 10 to 20 years. This result absolutely amazed me, absolutely astounded me. Most people, these expert decision makers, the majority of them are saying 1960s or earlier. 
Well, 1960s Aureli was 50 years ago. Would you drive a 50 year old car? Would you be happy if you showed up to your doctor and they said, all right, well, we're gonna now, you need a pacemaker, so I'm going to install a 50 year old pacemaker in your chest. Who would stand for that? What other sector in the world do we stand for things uh, being widely acknowledged as being as behind the times as this? So there is a massive groundswell of frustration in the teaching and training world. There is a colossal hunger for new things and those of us who embrace the new things will find a good reception. Here's what we're gonna talk about today. First of all, uh, all of the mysteries that, uh, that there are to do with human beings, training, learning, teaching, anything around that are all hidden inside the brain. So with apologies to anyone who might already know some neuroanatomy, it is absolutely essential to cover a little bit of neuroanatomy before you do anything else, just as you would need to know where the brake pedal is and what a carburetor is um, before you can drive your car with any degree of security. Next, we're gonna look at what can be measured right now today from the brain that is practically useful. Finally, uh, I'm going, oh, sorry, not finally, thirdly, I'm going to show you a real demonstration. You're actually gonna see this in action. This is a, an extract from a program that we did for television a little while ago, and we have their permission to show it to you today. We're of course are gonna look at the implications for teaching, K to 12 teaching certainly, but teaching in general, and even more important than teaching, learning. And finally, what are some likely futures? That's all to do with where it is today, but where do we think it's gonna to go tomorrow? And I hope to give you the insight there, not just from my own opinion, which is a lot less important than that of many others, but also some of the leading thinkers and practitioners in the field today and where they think it's going and where they are going. So let's make a start. So here it is, folks. Weighs about a pound and a half. Uh, it has about 100 billion neurons. This is the most complicated thing we know about in the universe. There may be more complicated things in the universe, but if so, we don't know what they are. Uh, Robert Frost famously said, we dance around in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle and knows. The relevance of that to today um, is, that, um, is that we know so little about the brain. And anyone who tells you they're an expert and know everything about the brain, be very wary of them because the world's leading experts like Ron Stevens and others will tell you that they know very little. Either way, the answer to every question that we might ask is hidden in here. So let's take a little look. This is not gonna be an anatomy lesson, so please don't panic. But I just wanted you to see that the, that the structure that is deep inside the brain is at least as important as the structure we can see from looking outside the brain. And I am gonna talk about a couple of these structures later on in the session, but only a couple. Just note that the inside of the brain, the structure is very complicated, and we think we know what most of these things do, at least for the purpose of today's discussion. That is actually a much longer discussion. Are we really right when we say a particular part of the brain does a particular thing? But for today's discussion, we're just gonna call it good. The most important thing I wanna cover about neuroanatomy before we move on to the subject of what we can measure now is neural pathways. What is a neural pathway? Well, just as importantly, what it is not. Uh, a neural pathway is not some trendy, hippy-dippy, latest um, phony discovery from some consultant trying to get rich quick, having written a book that's gonna be on the bookshelves for three weeks until it's replaced by the latest, newest, bright, shiny, hippy-dippy thing. Neural pathways are far more fundamental than that. And we're gonna come back to that a little bit later in the session as, as well. This is what we think is at the absolute heart of brain function. So I'm going to see if I can uh, get the laser pointer, and indeed I can get the laser pointer. So for example, uh, there is a structure here at the base of the brain called the amygdala. Uh, that structure is the Yahoo, Yippee, uh, Aren't We Great Center. It's the center that makes you do the happy dance. And we think that there is a neural pathway there to uh, sequencing actions and planning things in this part of the brain, which is the frontal lobe. But there's another neural pathway to this part of the brain that's to do with memory and learning which should be what a lot of us care about. To another section here, this is the inferior parietal lobe. It's got a similar role in memory and learning, we think. And to this here, which is more subtle, it's, a, it's kind of a junction center, it's a railway junction. The point is that this seems to be the way the brain works when we learn. So information comes in, we hear it with the part of the brain that does the listening, which is this part here, it's about the size of a quarter. And then the neural pathways go from there 
to there, to there, to there, to there, to there. It's like a big game of post office. Mapping these neural pathways is thought to be the future of understanding how we think and learn and perceive and benefit from serious gaming or don't. Apply serious gaming to the practical world rather than just having a good time on the company's money or don't. And the uh, new version of the DSM, which many of you as educators will know, the DSM is the big blue book of every known state of being, particularly of thought, feeling and action for human beings. Currently, we're up to the DSM-5. If there is a DSM-6, what do I mean if? I'll get to that later. But if there is a DSM-6, the American Psychiatric Association has absolutely irrevocably committed themselves to all of the models in the DSM-6 being neurodynamic models. In other words, models about teaching and learning and training and thought, feeling and action that are all to do with the sequencing of neural pathways in the brain and much less to do with the old fashioned psychology. We would say things like, uh, the child exhibits frequent episodes of irrational behavior. Well, that's nice, but what's frequent? What does that mean? What's irrational? You and I might disagree on both these things. Science is coming soon to a place near you. This is going to be the science. And be, before you go later. on, there was a really yeah. interesting question. Does this, does, do those pathways change based on different deficits? Like if a person is sightless or a person can't hear, do those pathways change? Thank you. And I'm going to normally repeat the questions I'm used to public speaking, but in this case, I'll assume you all heard the question loud and clear, so I shan't. Do the pathways change? I want to be very careful to stick to what we know, because you're going to hear a lot of charlatanism on this subject later, and we're going to cover that today too. Here's what we know. We know that the pathways change as the tasks change, and it's the tasks get harder, particularly. I'm going to show you some examples of that later. What happens with deficits, cognitive deficits, or if the task is harder for that person, I am less sure, but one of the great hopes from this research is diagnostics. And we're gonna look at some potential diagnostics in a minute. The University of Arizona has a particular interest in autism, for example. So they have a strong interest in using that research for that purpose. Um, I've mentioned the amygdala, the place where it all meets, the Yahoo Center, the trigger point for memory, decision-making and emotional responses. I mention this importantly because in all serious gaming, this is the structure in the brain that you should be trying to trigger. The Yahoo, that was awesome, aren't we great? This was fantastic, this is terrific. And we get up and we do the happy dance and then we sit down again. The same for face-to-face -face training. This is what we're targeting all the time in our leadership development simulations because if you can stimulate the amygdala, here's the important part, the amygdala stimulates the development of neural pathways. And there is no software at all in the brain, none. Uh, in computers, yes, in your phone, sure, but in your brain, none, uh, just hardware. And the amygdala is what stimulates new hardware to be built. So when the kid discovers that riding a bike is an awesome feeling, that's when the amygdala stimulates the brain to build bike riding circuits. And then that child will be able to ride a bike for the rest of their life. Stimulating the amygdala is, as far as we know, pretty much the ball game right now. So here are some things that to remember. You'll get the notes from this, by the way, if you want them. So first of all, we have about 100 billion brain cells. Just for reference, uh, a, a termite has about 300,000 brain cells, and they, of course, build structures of the most incredible complexity. We do not understand the complexity of the brain. No one does. It is a mystery. Robert Frost still applies. But neural pathways, as far as we can tell today, are going to be the future of insight, particularly for those of us who are interested in practical applications, measurement, the impact on remote learning, and perhaps new and different activities we can do with people to help with that. Players currently in the field include, but are by no means limited to UCLA, the University of California, Los Angeles, uh, that we are partners with them in a small way, the Brain Research Institute there in the School of Medicine, I've already mentioned that, Sandia National Laboratories, and the University of Arizona. And Arizona, as I've mentioned, has that particular interest which I'm gonna cover in a moment in trying to get some insight into autism and specific learning disabilities. Um, this is what the headsets look like that the research is done on of whose results I'm about to show you. These are high quality research grade headsets. The kind of headset a kid would use, the kind that it's gonna be available in two to five years, is gonna cost just a few dollars and it'll just pop on the side of your head like one of those uh, Jabra telephone headsets now, it won't be nearly as intrusive. You won't need conductive gel. You won't need any mucking around. 
There are two things we think we can measure right now. And the two things we can measure are engagement and workload. And that I'm pretty confident in telling you because that's been done successfully for a while now, measuring engagement and workload. Uh, engagement is the degree to which we are focused on the task ahead of us. So let's suppose I'm doing very fine needlepoint, not that I know how to, but the slightest mistake and you're gonna mess up hours and hours of work. So I would think when you're doing very fine needlepoint, your engagement would be very high. What about workload? Uh, workload is how hard your brain is working. So if you've been doing needlepoint for 30 years, it's probably not working that hard when you do needlepoint. However, if you are doing algebra, particularly if you're new to it. Now, by training, I should have mentioned, uh, I'm a mathematician. Um, I, was a, I, I studied math at the National Cryptologic School and before that at the University of Melbourne, also qualified in psychology. And believe it or not, I worked in the intelligence community for 10 years. I was an intelligence officer and then founded Team Results USA with a colleague who was a fighter pilot. So workload for us, of course, would be learning uh, something brand new. Uh, learning how to do calculus, if you're not very familiar with calculus, would be a high workload on the brain. So engagement, how focused you are on the task, workload, how hard your brain is chugging away. Because we can measure these two things, we can get results. And I'm not going to get into this, so please don't be apprehensive. But here's what I want to show you. Uh, I was asked earlier whether there is a cognitive difference in patterns. Well, here you can see it. And this is real science. So here we're seeing state transitions as measured in the brains of not one person, but six people all together, all six people. And here you're seeing the gestalt brain, the team brain, and the transitions in electric, electrical states in the brain. This is what it looks like transiting from, from A to B, where the problem is easy. All I want you to see is that when the problem gets harder, the map changes, it looks different. And the last thing I want you to see is that down the bottom here, that's what rubbish looks like. That's what no results looks like. That's what it would look like if there was nothing to any of these theories and the null hypothesis for you scientifically people applied. In other words, the hypothesis of no difference. So look at rubbish and look at that. You can see this is clearly not rubbish. There is structure here. There is something very profound going on here. And there's something equally profound going on here. The fascinating thing about this is that what you're looking at, folks, is the equivalent of putting an engine analyzer onto the engine of a car. Engine analyzers change the lives of mechanics around the world. Instead of trying to guess from the smell of the exhaust or the sound of the engine, you could just pop an engine analyzer on the car and see what the engine was really doing. We are getting to the point where we can pop technology on your head and my head and see what's really going on. Not just for the individuals, but for the whole team. So the rather fanciful title of today's talk, can well, when machines read minds. Do machines really read minds? Well, not in the science fiction sense, no, but in this sense, yes. The machine is looking at your brain and it is looking at what's going on inside your brain and it is applying significance to the patterns that it sees. Let's look at a practical example. Uh, these symbols that come from a whole team of people can obviously be mapped and when they are mapped, we can draw the diagrams of the kind that you've seen. All you're seeing there is a the method of mapping. And now looking at teams of people, and I want you to imagine a classroom now. We find looking at the actual brain that there seem to be five states they can be in. Uh, collegiate, which is when everybody is working together at the same level of workload and engagement. It's truly collegiate. Dominant. Dominant means one person's in charge and they're clearly in charge and we've all experienced that. Dormant means everybody's pretty zoned out. Um, there's, not, there's a low level of workload and engagement right across the team and there's really no fine structure in that group, in that class. There's, there's nobody that's particularly far outside that envelope. Dyadic, the exact opposite. Well, not the opposite, but sort of. Dyadic is when there is clearly leadership, but it's not one leader. There's a group of leaders. There's a small cadre of leaders. And we've all seen that in work teams. And finally, outlier. Here's another thing I'll guarantee you that you've seen, um, which is when the whole team is pretty much on the same page. The whole class is pretty much on the same page, except for a small number of outliers and Lord only knows where they are, but they're certainly not in the same place as the rest of the team. And you can imagine these as stations on the underground or stations on the subway. And you can imagine a group of people in a class or in a corporate environment as having the option to transit between any of these states, just as you do when you catch the line from one subway station to another. 
and the chaos model, never mind, that's just what we called it. Now, I don't want you to look at this in any detail. I just want you to look at the way the pictures change as I flick between them. That's all, that's all I intend to show you here. This is an easy problem. This is a problem we designed uh, and a practical, um, a practical serious game that was done in the physical world. We designed this for UCLA. They did this with a team of people, a team of workers. You'll see the outlier state is the most popular state. Dyadic's pretty popular as well. And this state transition with the X through it never gets used. So what? Well, so this, let's make the problem harder. Stare at this really hard and watch it change. Here we go. Look at that. Suddenly, the dominant mode becomes more important. As the problem gets harder, it looks like you're much more likely to see someone step and say, oh, hang on, look, let's, let me run this, all right? Just all you, shut up, let me run this. And people willingly go along with that if the problem is harder. So these are theoretical problems. And again, let me show you the change. Easy problem, hard problem. Easy problem, hard problem. So you can see dynamic, neurodynamic states changing. And finally, it doesn't get more real than this. Now you're looking at the brains of a group of six nuclear submariners and they're steering a nuclear submarine around the ocean. And this is the pattern that they exhibit. So that's a nuclear submarine. That's a pretty responsible job. So here we have one last time, then I'm going to move on. Uh, just a minute. An easy, now just stare at it and watch the changes. That's all you're doing like a movie. So easy artificial problem, uh, an easy serious game, to a harder serious game, to something that's not a game at all, steering a nuclear submarine around the Pacific. What I hope you get from these is a sign that we really are beginning to get some things from the science. Here's what we can measure now. Primarily workload and engagement are the two things I feel confident telling you. Many other things are being measured right now, but these are the two I feel confident telling you we really think we can measure these in a group, not, an not just an individual, but in a group. Next, anticipation and disbelief. Uh, we think we can measure these things um, as well. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, I mean that anticipation, it looks as though watching the activity of the brains with the technologies I've mentioned, that if a group of people think they are about to fail, they may already, they, they will tend to behave as though they already have. So if your class, if your group thinks they're about to fail at the science experiment or the math problem, you might find that behave as if they already have failed. And the opposite is true as well. We see clearly electrically in the brain that if the group thinks they are about to succeed, they often behave as though they have already succeeded, even though they haven't. The marker for anticipation. Disbelief is the cutting edge of where the research is now. That addresses the question of, yes, but when you're in a classroom, it's not the real world. Yes, but when you do a serious game, it's not real work. Do people just dismiss it? Do they say, well, that was one world, this is another. Um, I, I, don't, I don't believe it. It's sort of like watching the dragon in the movie and it's so badly animated that you just can't make yourself believe it. There's a lot of work being done now on what structure problems and teaching and learning have to have so that you solve the problem of suspension of disbelief. And finally, most important point, what I'm talking about here is about one one hundredth of a percent of what's coming this way. Developments in this field are weekly. That's how fast it is. So watch this space. We are in a golden age. We are in the biggest age of change and reimagining of models in individual team and group psychology since Sigmund Freud. This is a golden era. Let's see some proof of that. You're about to see some people steering a toy car using their brains. This is a device that we built in team results. It's not as good as the device UCLA had, but it's not as expensive either. You're about to see it. We built a device that collects a workload and engagement signal from two different people. Uh, if I put on a headset, and we'll go to the next slide here and I'll show you. Oh no, we won't, all right, didn't have that, fine. If I put on a headset and my workload and engagement is sufficiently high, that little car is gonna go forward and to the left. If you put on the matching headset and your neurodynamic workload and engagement is sufficiently high, that car will go forward and to the right. The game, both of us have to do what every teacher thinks we can get a class to do in the classroom, which is get everybody, in this case two people, to raise, to simultaneously raise their neurodynamic workload and engagement to a high level together. And when they do that, of course, the car goes straight. So this is a lot of fun. And there's some audio here and you're about to see the fun. 
here you see John, this is a television program. That's the device that actually measures and shows them the workload. Here we see some young people. You can see red, here we go. Red, 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 it's working. Red, 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 Focusing as hard as possible. Yellow, they're louder. Yes. Uh, that always gives me a buzz. We were very lucky uh, that on live television, that thing actually hit the little cone. It looks really good. <laughs> so here's what I want to tell you about the real demonstration. Firstly, most importantly, this stuff is not imaginary. Uh, we built this car because we felt, and people who know far more than I felt, that if I just tried to explain this stuff to people, they would assume it was just BS because it sounds like BS. It sounds like, it sounds like wishful thinking and like marketing, but no, this stuff is real. It's going on right now in serious universities. Secondly, commercial applications aren't coming. They're here today. Um, at the uh, last Olympics, there was an exoskeleton being used for somebody who was paraplegic that was driven by the exact same technologies you just saw, just a more sophisticated version. Commercial applications are coming now. The Consumer Electronics Show, the last one in Las Vegas a few weeks ago, had the beginnings of these. Next year, the two biggest things in the CES are going to be these applications in both health and training. Teaching and health are going to be the biggest sectors where we see these technologies. Now, here's the great hope uh, that I have, uh, particularly for teaching and training. You can recall, I hope, the five-point uh, Pentagon that we looked at earlier. And here, all we've done is we've taken the Pentagon and inked in the pathways that are in most heavy use for a particular team, for a particular group, or maybe for a particularly cognitive deficit. This might be a group of people who test as normal. This could be a group of people who test for, for low end, um, uh, for, low, for what used to be called uh, low end uh, Asperger's and is now being rebadged re um, to, uh, to low end autism. Um, these sorts of diagnostics for groups and for individuals are one of the great hopes and that we might be able to look at a person's cognition, uh, map a person's cognition and say, this is what's going on. Here's the cognitive deficit and here's what's going to be done about it. We're not there yet, but uh, there are a lot of extremely bright people, including my friend, Professor Ron Stevens, who are working on that right now. A lot of cherished ideas are going to go away too. If you've ever done corporate training, you will have heard this one. Team stands for together. Everyone achieves more. Or the other one is there's no I in team. Well, I can confirm to you today that that's just plain wrong. There's a huge I in team. There it is. Specifically, instead of together, everyone achieves more. That's not really true. We've all seen people in groups achieve absolute chaos together. It's probably more accurate to say that teams employ all modes. And all five modes that, are, that we looked at before are really important. There's no one best mode. It's not as though collegiate is the desired mode. And if your team's in any other mode, there's something wrong with you. That's not true. The outlier mode, for example, turns out to be absolutely essential in the piloting of a nuclear submarine. Who knew? We only found this out by measurement. And then this famous one, forming, storming, norming, and performing. Uh, Albert Tuckman, 1972. Everyone, anyone with teaching or psychological training knows this one. The only problem is it's not true. Uh, what groups actually do is bounce around that five state model much, much faster than that. So it's probably more accurate to say, watch the teams and watch the learning group very closely because their dynamics changes very, very quickly. I'm talking about seconds, snooze and you miss it. And when you say teams employ all modes, are you finding that effective teams employ all modes or effective teams employ some of the modes? What, or do that all teams a, employ all modes? That is a great question. And the answer is all teams employ all modes. Uh, if you're a mathematician, you would say that these modes are both necessary and sufficient. In other words, all five modes are needed. You cannot do without any of them. And all of them seem to have a role in the behavior of a learning group or a healthy team. You can't dismiss one as dysfunctional or one as desirable. There's really no such thing. There's the pattern that's right for the situation. For these five modes are the five we see in the neurodynamic state transition. There's not four modes, there's not six modes. It seems as though there are five, but they're all needed. And here's how they're needed. If, if practice is the best preparation, then practicing and developing these neural pathways in groups gets you operational readiness, it gets productivity improvement, 
bridges the gap between real between talking about something and doing it. And these are completely different parts of the brain. The part that talks and listens, two different areas, they're each about the size of a quarter. The whole rest of the brain does other stuff. Um, understanding what the issues are, the intellectual component, and finally simulating and practicing and rehearsing till you get good strategies. What the coat research is suggesting is if you put all these together, you get this. <laughs> you get competence. Okay, you're about to hear it for real. Um, if you want my opinion, this is one of the most astonishing uh, uh, demonstrations I've ever seen, uh, particularly if I can make it work. Just a minute. Give me a moment, folks. All right, I don't know how to make that work. How do I turn off the laser pointer, please, Maestro? Yeah, that's a good question. And I've, and I've haven't, usually if you hit laser pointer again, it would turn off, but uh, it doesn't appear to be working. Use your escape button on the keyboard. Ah, thank you, Donna. Thank you, Donna. And now thanks to Donna, who is our new hero, we get to hear this. You're actually gonna hear, get this, the music, of the living brains of six nuclear submariners as they pilot a nuclear submarine into danger and then back out of danger. You'll be able to follow what danger they're in by looking at the red writing on the screen. That tracks it. It tells you what's going on as you listen. So one of the UCLA people had the brilliant idea of setting this to music using a Moog synthesizer. So you are literally, for the first time ever in human history, listening to the living brains of six nuclear submariners as they, as they get a $2 billion nuclear submarine into, into trouble and then back out of trouble. This is just sound. Listen up. That is what the brain sounds like when it says, oh shit. <laughs> and you're hearing it for the, for the first time. Um, there is a lot more of this coming and I'm sure you can easily imagine something like this being applied to a classroom as well. And we learn a lot about how they work in their teams. So here are the messages. Firstly, implications for teachers, trainers and makers of serious games. There are many products coming your way to a place near you many product pitches, a lot of people that are gonna to wanna to sell you on products and sell you on ideas. And your defense against that is to return to the fundamental science and ask yourself, does it make sense? Plenty of science is gonna be out there. Unfortunately, the minute there's plenty of science, Richard Feynman, the famous physicist who won the Nobel Prize, noted that at a talk in Caltech in 1973, wherever there's plenty of science, there's plenty of charlatans trying to misappropriate the language of science in order to make their products seem more attractive. It is absolutely essential that you and me, teachers, trainers, designers of serious gaming, sellers of serious gaming, all kinds of serious gaming, whether it's face-to-face -face like mine or online like some others, it is absolutely essential that we stay abreast of the current science. It is your only defense against about a thousand people who are gonna try and tell you stuff about this technology and where this is going over the next two to five years. And finally, folks, uh, you're going to be the deciders, uh, ready or not. In the famous words of, of Colin Powell, don't be buffaloed by experts or elites. They frequently have more knowledge than judgment. Well, you're the, you're the judges. You're the ones with the judgment. The trainers, the educators, the developers, the builders, the thinkers, the innovators. You're going to be the deciders of what to go with and what not to go with. And all I can suggest is you do what, what we're doing, which is try and stay across the science as much as we can. The sellers will not be the deciders. You'll be. You'll be the ones deciding what to buy. The DSM-5 is an example of changes that are coming. There may not be a DSM-6. We don't know. 
And those of you who are used to the DSM-5, this may come as a shock, and I'm sorry. The National Institutes of Mental Health refused to recognise the DSM-5 for the first time ever. Reason? Too much hand-waving arguments, not enough science. Too much stuff in the book that says, if the child exhibits frequent bouts of irrationality and loss of, loss of control over temper, you may make the diagnosis. NIMH's objection to that is, what's irrationality? Where is that defined? What does frequent mean? Um, and the DSM-5 is full of language like that. They decided it was time to move to science. And if the American Psychiatric Association does not move to science, there may not ever be a DSM-6. The APA is promising that the DSM-6 will be entirely modelled around, quote, unquote, or uh, what was it now? All, uh, that's right. All aspects of human thought, feeling and action will be mapped to the function of specific circuits in the brain, quote unquote. I don't see how they can do that in the time they've got, but this is the extent of the revolutionary change that we're talking about today. It's actually threatening the very existence of what is now the most popular guideline for any kind of dysfunction in both adults and children. And are there any measurements for, let's say, social and emotional intelligence or uh, or learning that it enhances social emotional intelligence? There's hope for the kinds of diagnostics that you've seen to date, but all of this is developing right now. And that's where I have my personal doubt, given that the DSMs come out on a spacing of four to six years, that they're going to be ready in time for the DSM-6. It's like saying get to Mars in four years. I, I don't know that they can do it, um, but that is a debate that's going on right now. And it's a very tense debate. Expect to see more scientific papers coming out. Keep an eye on those. This is one that, that, that I know I can put up without getting sued because I'm a co-author of it with Professor Ron Stevens on neurodynamic models for group and team evolution. But the point is there are lots of papers like this now and you should try and read some of these and keep up to date with, this, with the science. And also be aware of the privacy risks. This is something that's not being anticipated right now and it is coming our way like nobody's business. When you connect an EEG headset, which sounds like a little bit of fun, little plastic thing goes in your head. You're going to see this in the gaming industry first and foremost, because the gaming industry has lots of money and there are no didactic or, or, or strong ethical limits on what they can do. And it's going to cost 19 bucks. You'll stick it on your head and it will enhance your gameplay on any of the shoot 'em up Xbox 360 style games that are around now. And it's going to be great. All the while that thing is collecting information from your brain. Where is that information going? Ah, good question. Is it being sold? Don't know. But the answer in fact is yes, of course it's being sold because there's money in it. Is that personal private information? Probably. Is it health information? Nobody knows. If it's health information, it's covered by HIPAA. If it's not, it isn't. And there's new privacy legislation coming. So as these invasive revealing technologies come along, as machines really do get to be able to read minds in some sense, Privacy, which is not discussed at the moment, will become one of the biggest issues out there. Uh, declaring my bias in advance, I will tell you that my wife happens to be an expert in this field. And if you go to that website there, privacypastpresentfuture.com, you can find out more about privacy than my very brief summary today. If you really want to get into it, her name is Dr. Leslie Groose. She spent 30 years at the National Security Agency, the NSA, and she's a privacy specialist. And if your institution's interested, you can certainly get a copy of that book. Telling doesn't work because we're programmed not to remember things, but to forget things. We're programmed at um, getting mad with people when they don't remember fine details doesn't work because we're designed not to be accurate, but to be fast. One of the big, that's one of the big discoveries. We're programmed to forget anything whose significance isn't immediately apparent. And we're programmed to go as fast as we can. And if that means leaving the conclusions and making broad generalizations and ignoring details, that's just too bad. Because in evolutionary terms, speed was better than slow, fast was better than slow, and remembering the important things was better than remembering the trivial things. This again is just another example of what we're learning that whether we like it or not, the brain's going to do what it does, and we're learning. Measurement is going to become a very big deal. This is the way we do measurement of team productivity improvement based on behavior. All you can see is an improvement going from low to high and then renorming back to a kind of new normal over time. A lot more of that, a lot more measurement in teaching and training. And I know that measurement's controversial in those fields, but we're going to see a lot more of it. And finally, uh, some people are going to be really offended. 
because some babies are just, well, not the prettiest babies. <laughs> some of the cherished models, some of the things that people have affinity for that are received wisdom uh, that people pontificate about are going to go and they're not going to be able to be saved. Things like forming, storming, norming and performing, for example, or the idea that all teaching, training and learning can be done verbally, when in fact, a very tiny amount of the brain is devoted to that. These cherished ideas are going to have to go and we're going to have to let them go. So the future will be driven by the gaming industry because they have the money. There will be no moral compass unless you supply it. So the ethics that come with being in a school, in a school environment or a tertiary environment will not come in the box. They will have to be supplied by the school and the tertiary environment. And it will be controversial because these technologies can do anything, i.e. good stuff and bad stuff. And the famous words of Ian Malcolm from Jurassic Park, just because you can doesn't mean you should. In the famous words of John Collins repost to Ian Malcolm, had I been at Jurassic Park, Ian, people are going to do things just because they can, regardless of whether or not they should. So look out for that. Privacy challenges will be absolutely enormous. Uh, they will not stop the train. The train's unstoppable. But privacy will be one of the major way stations. And you as the guardians of your particular industry, teaching, training, learning, K-12, colleges, whatever, will have to be the guardians at the gate for that. And measurement is not going anywhere. So some quick Actually, conclusions. So be, even yeah. before your conclusions, yeah. um, just a, there are a few questions based on a couple of the slides that I, th I thought would be, would be really interesting. We're in good time. So you had mentioned our, our brain is going to do what it does. On the yeah. other hand, there's the, there's the uh, we, we all understand that there's neuroplasticity. So um, can we use neuroplasticity or can we direct what the brain gets good at? You're asking a question, Mitch, that has fascinated me ever since I was a young student in university, wondering whether I should be choosing psychology or psychiatry. And in later years, I've begun to think psychiatry made a better choice. Because the question is how much of the brain's behavior is physiological? How much is physiological? How much is psychological? How much comes, with, how much comes in the box? And how much is acquired later through the formation of neural pathways? Um, certain things like a fear of falling and a fear of loud noises, are definitely built in. We don't learn those, they're built in. Uh, other things, of course, like a fear of doing the algebra exam <laughs> is quite clearly a neural pathway that we built at some point. It is not known where the boundary is between these two things. However, uh, it's becoming clear that a lot of behavior is more fit, deeply physiologically rooted than we thought. Uh, does that mean it can be changed? Of course it can, but it might be harder. And forming new neural pathways is hard, requires repetition, Old neural pathways are very strong. A very good example of that is giving up smoking. There's a chemical component to that too, but any form of smoker will tell you there's a tremendous psychological component. So the answer to that is not known, but it's going, it's somewhere on that continuum between physiology and psychology. And then just, a, there's another really interesting sure. question around gaming, because when you're playing a game, you're, you're stimulating the, the limbic system and, um, uh, and the question is, are there longer term ramifications of that? Does the brain change? The brain absolutely changes. I'm glad to be able to answer a question definitively. That is one of the biggest discoveries in psychology of this century. When I was a student many years ago, we were told the brain does not change and you're stuck with what you've got. And if you have brain damage, that's too bad. We now know that is absolutely not true. The things we do with the brain changes, change our brain permanently, permanently. They add, they don't increase the number of brain cells. You are stuck with that, but they do alter the connections between the brain cells. In other words, they do install and modify neural pathways. They change the brain chemically and they change the brain anatomically. Uh, restaurant waiters in high end restaurants, the ones who can remember 10 orders with substitutions, never write anything down and never get anything wrong. After they've been waiters for about uh, 20 years, a structure in the brain called the anterior cingulate gyrus is much larger in them than it is in regular people. So you absolutely can change the brain. Neuroplasticity, although it has been used as a buzzword by charlatans, is real. And that actually is the perfect segue to my first summary point from the neuroanatomy, which is just understanding a little bit of brain anatomy and function will help you so much in your role as an educator and a designer of games. Right now, we know that we can measure workload, engagement, anticipation, and disbelief but there's a lot more coming. We'll be able to measure a lot more very soon. 
We know that it's not imaginary, and there are technologies right now that can demonstrate before your very dis before your own disbelieving eyes that this stuff is completely real. And the implications are there for teaching. Everything will change, but there are going to be some big challenges to existing methodologies, existing thinking, and certainly privacy. In the future, there's going to be a new normal. Augmented cognition will be routine. It will be expected. The new generation of young people growing up will never have known anything else. It will be normal to them to not use augmented cognition will be profoundly weird, just as using it is profoundly weird now <laughs> to those of us who are at or past middle age. It will become completely normal. It will become so cheap that eventually, it will very soon, it will migrate from the gaming industry into education. And just as everyone used to have to have a ruler in my day, and if you didn't bring a ruler to math class, they'd give you a detention. Um, everybody's going to have a little neural headset and it'll be cheap. Remember the human being and wrap up and then questions. Be thinking of questions if you have any. We will have time. We are still human. We don't stop being human because of technology or because of augmented cognition. We are all still on a quest for our own personal holy grail. If you can find out what people's holy grail is and help them on that quest, they will help you. And that is the way to work with people and to get results with people to find out what's important to them, what their holy grail is, and help them work on it. Technology is a good servant and a bad master. Never forget the human being. Here we see some human beings managing a serious game designed and run by us. This, of course, is a face-to-face -face serious game. And here we see the reason, oh, excuse me, and here, uh, oh, I thought I had a, another picture. I don't, all right. And here is just an example of some of the people that are interested in what I'm talking about today. This is a subset of our company's client list, but it's not that that's important. What's important is serious people, senior people in every one of these organizations is really interested in where augmented cognition is going, and some of them are spending serious money on it. Um, I can't finish any session without thanking the amazing people I work with. I know these faces are just for me, but my heart is warms just for thanking these incredible people. Uh, all of them are far smarter than me. And that's about two thirds of our team. So books you might like to read. Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize winner in uh, 2002 for proving that human cognition is not rational and in the process completely upsetting the science of economics. The Village Effect, Susan Pinker, uh, who in her book uh, provides a lot of evidence to say that we do need human contact and that uh, the loss of human contact is something that teaching and training and learning industry and the business world cannot support. So technologies need to promote it, not interfere with it. And finally, if you care, I wrote a book about, le about leadership and happiness at work called Crocodile Charlie and the Holy Grail. All these books are on Amazon. Your notes will contain a more detailed reading list here. Of course, don't read it now, but just to let you know, if you ask Mitch for the notes, that's what you'll get. And finally, if you'd like to contact me, and I'm gonna leave this slide up for the questions, you are incredibly welcome to do so. Uh, a disclaimer, um, the company I work for, we are not consultants. We're not trying to sell time. Um, uh, any amount of talking, help, referrals, chats, video conferences is all uh, complimentary with our compliments. It's our way of giving back. So don't worry that this is some kind of sales. Come on, it's not. If you want to book a simulation with us, that's different, but that's not what we're talking about today. The door is wide open. Please walk through it. At this point, I'd like to pause. Uh, and hand over to our uh, director of ceremonies again to deal with any remaining outstanding questions. And Mitch, I'm going to rely on you to run the technology. And according to me, we have seven minutes. Over to you. Okay. So, so number one, uh, people have been asking about the slides, and I will post the slides up on our edgeheadinteractive.org website with the archive um, probably tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, and then I'll email everybody to say that it's there. Um, one of the one of the premises here was was that we would talk about how teaching is going to change, and I heard a lot about that teaching is going to change. But are there, let's say, a couple things that you can point to that are likely to change about teaching in the next two to three years? Certainly. Let me just check again that you can see my face now. Yep, all you're right, you're fully on. Uh, Teaching is going to change because of all the technologies and developments that we've been talking about, but I'm going to pick two to answer your question. The first of all is a question for the audience, a decision to make themselves. Remember when you saw the little car in the, uh, in the circle there on that television program that we did, and you saw before the car went straight, 
how much time it's spent going around in circles one way and then going around in circles the other way. And everybody's yelling, red, red, green, green, green. Green means, by the way, high workload engagement. Red means none, yellow is in the middle. And so they're, how they're cheering uh, each of the two people and how long it took before they were able to get into the same space cognitively. And when they did, the car went straight. Now imagine it's a class of 30 students. And now imagine the number of times you've heard somebody say that through the magic of their voice, they can hold a class of 30 students spellbound and get them into exactly the same cognitive space together and see the reality, how hard it is to do it with two people, willing adults, people who are doing everything they can to cooperate. I think that we are headed for much more feedback in the classroom. We're gonna be able to see what people's brains are doing. It will be measured, you'll be able to see it. The teacher will have a console and maybe the headmaster will have a console in their office, horrible thought, that tells them <laughs> what the workload and engagement for their group looks like when they're zoned in, when they're zoned out, when they're not. So if in, these devices end up cost, you know, let's say in two years or $15 a piece. Take it two years. Uh, then every student who's taking a class online uh, could be having one of these devices. There's a dashboard in front of the teacher as a, as a teacher is conducting something. And, the, you know, the teacher could, hey, um, hey, John, I see you're not really paying attention. Or uh, Marianne, I see you that you're not engaged. Or, um, hey, you two, you seem to be in sync. Are you doing something on the side? Um, it gives the teacher or the, the conductor of the class, um, I guess, more power, more capabilities to channel the students into being more productive. Yes. Or, horrible thought, but it's going to happen. Or the principal calls you to their office and says, all right, math teacher Mitch, <laughs> how come your classes are much more engaged and much more inactive and much more active than all the other teachers' classes? What's your secret? <laughs> right. Is, <laughs> well, I give, them, might, I, I give them drugs, that's <laughs> right. Or it might be the reverse. Why are you, right. you know, why your, why your class is owned out more than anybody else? The, the second area, the area we're gonna see at first though, is in kids with specific learning disabilities. Uh, these tools will emerge from the game space, which will do most of the funding, and that's happening now specifically into the, area, into the area of specific learning disabilities first, because they can be used clinically by clinicians without the same massive privacy issues. HIPAA covers it. And you know now, and most of the today's people will know that the existing diagnostics for autism, I really wish they hadn't got rid of the Asperger's diagnosis, but that's another story. The, a lot of the early diagnostic tools for autism and many other kinds of learning disabilities are very poor. They're anecdotal, they're based in behavioral inference. It's a colossal unmet need. That, I think, right. I hope that we're headed for a golden age in that area and that a lot of kids who have struggled will not struggle as much. Um, I myself am ADD and ADHD. Most intelligence officers are, most police officers are, most firefighters are. We are the people who run toward the flames and the screaming, not away, because we can't bear to be left out, even if it's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> and we often go on to have good careers, but school, not so much a lot of the time. Um, any other Pam, questions? Yeah, well, Pam had a really good uh, comment, which is that this also will allow educators um, to see which students are struggling and where their cognitive Absolutely. levels are very high. Totally true. Uh, massive insight in the same way as the MRI provided new levels of insight for the human body, augmented cognition is going to provide new levels of insight for the brain, and that is the great hope and teaching and training will be one of the first places we see it. I realize that the headset technology change, is changing really fast, mm. but uh, Samrat asked, uh, is there a particular headset that you would recommend now? So I would look at a company called NeuroSky, and I want to stress very strongly, I do not work for them, accept no money for them, and there are better headsets, but what NeuroSky is doing is building to a price, and we all know that the education industry is limited with money. And NeuroSky seems to be very, very conscious of that. So they're building simple little headsets with a headband that goes there. There's just one electrode there over the left orbit. That's the whole purpose of the headband. And one clip there, which is actually an earthing clip on the left earlobe, it's called the pinner, if you want to be really technical and impress people, or you could just call it the earlobe. Um, and it's measuring primarily a sagittal signal. In other words, that way, sideways, on the brain from there to there. Um, those technologies are very cheap. Um, and you could look at some others as well. The other thing I would do is I would go to the digest for the CES, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, 
that digest is available online on the CES website and look at their digest of what's available in headsets, especially if you want something more sophisticated than the NeuroSky headsets. But NeuroSky can sell you a developer's kit now for I think a hundred bucks. I mean, it's just so cheap and it will get cheaper. Any other questions? Well, yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a question comment about universal design for learning and what it kind of mm. triggers is that this basically could provide evidence that different aspects of universal design for learning are really significantly more effective for engagement and memory and learning. I'd go so far as to say will. Well, uh, and, and the highest concession I'd make is probably will. And that's what I meant in the earlier uh, talk, which is that, of course, it's going to be wonderful in the new age. And I'm hoping a lot of people that have educational needs will find some relief. But there'll also be people who are angry and upset as their pet models are disproved. And that's inevitable with science. So we all need to get ready to let go of some cherished beliefs. And uh, are you seeing any use for, say, addiction treatment? Totally. Um, what we know of addiction is that there seem to be three predominant mitigating, uh, there's, a, there's a clear addiction pathway in the brain and it seems to go from three places. It's like catching the train. It, you know, you go from Washington DC to Baltimore to New York, except that the pathways actually uh, don't do that. They switch back on themselves. Uh, don't quote me on this, but I think it's there to there to there or something like that. Um, anyway, there is a clear pathway that seems to be common to all addictions. If there is a DSM-6, the promise is the addictions will be fused. So internet addiction, sex addiction, alcoholism, drug addiction, behavioral addictions will all appear in the same part and under the same diagnosis in the DSM because we think they are all mitigated by the same neural pathway. And knowing what that neural pathway is, is a big step toward being able to stop it. Okay, and I think a lot of the responses that we're getting were thank you. Uh, there's one like, one question like, how do we know that a particular head, that the NeuroSky headset works? And I think it's, it's basically um, that you can measure, you could just measure the signals and right. Right. But I think I understand the context of the question. And if I'm wrong, I apologize, but I think I know what the question is. How do you know what you're measuring? You're certainly measuring something, but how do you know it's the brain? It could be, you could be measuring my little finger for all, you know, these muscles. Um, look for independent scientific confirmation for any of these technologies. You will be beset with salespeople who will talk to you about the miraculous things their gadgets do, and most of them probably don't do any of it. So you absolutely have to read the research and follow the professional literature and look for independent testing of these things. Uh, muscle noise, just as one example, is still a big problem with these headsets. You wouldn't be able to use them on a gym class yet to see if they're paying attention to the teacher because the big muscles of the arms and legs make so much noise, that's all you right. measure. So much electrical noise, totally drowned. We, we in fact had a, a failure ourselves in research with the UCLA because we failed to allow for muscle noise. But for goodness sake, inform yourself, read the research, read the papers, because salespeople are gonna tell you anything. A lot of the research was in your notes on the last slide, which, yes. which we'll post, and people are asking, well, can we watch this again? Um, yeah, just wire uh, $50 to my uh, website. No, no. Um, we're going to, uh, I'm, I'm making an archive uh, and I intend to post the archive tomorrow and I'll let people know once the archive is up and the, and the notes will be up. Um, John, do you have some clo closing thoughts? I just want to thank you uh, for being here today and thank you individually for making a personal decision to be here today. Uh, there, is no, there is no more precious thing that you own than your time. Uh, I want you to know that I understand that and to thank you personally for your time and to remind you finally of one thing which I've already covered, which is Colin Powell's famous advice again. Don't let yourself be intimidated by these technologies or the sales pitches. You are in charge. You are the deciders. Uh, or as Powell would say, don't be buffalo by experts or elites. Just inform yourself a little. But remember that they often have more knowledge than judgment and that you're the supplier of the judgment and you're going to decide where this world goes. Thank you very much for your attention today. Yeah. And I just, as I don't mean to spoil your closing because it was so good, but I just keep on going back to this NASA study that found mm -hmm. that, uh, that kindergartners are significantly more creative than the vast majority of experts. And it's just like, remember that. <laughs> um, an expert is not necessarily creative. An expert is, uh, the, 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 the definition I heard is an expert is somebody who knows more and more about less, less and less.
So, well, John, um, I, I have to say you're a wide ranging expert um, because uh, you've, you've touched on a lot of different areas um, in neuroscience and, and cognition. And thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I hope to see you at a conference and see you online. Everybody else, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Hope to see you at another EdShed Interactive event or another serious play event. And uh, this is Mitch Weisberg, and you know, I'll sign off. John, take care. Okay, bye.